and everyone was like hit all their numbers physically in the best nick of their life they would have tasted good the crocs would have had the leanest freshest tasting Venison. wallaby team yeah. it was chaos we nearly lost half the team Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pass Offload with Max Leaf and uh, Ryan Wilson. Later on the show, we are going to be joined by none other than legendary Australian scrum half George Gregan. But before then, there is only one thing we really want to talk about. It's the tooth I'm, of Max Leaf. I'm gutted. I'm absolutely gutted. You leave that out for a good two weeks. I know it's back. You've got a missus. You don't need it back. Like, if you've knocked your tooth out, you keep it out for two weeks at least. I'm so I'm so disappointed know, actually, that you put it back in. I feel that I've let you down. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm upset. But I had another. I had a lovely weekend in London plan, so I couldn't be walking around like a hillbilly in London. Could oh, I? I don't know. Dragon? And even if like put something like a st- also, silver or gold tooth back in there. My enunciation goes out. That it, I get full Mike Tyson lisp on that puppy when it's out. Tell us what happened. What happened? How so did you get big, your, big, your big, tooth knocked out? We were in. We were in the first half of an incredible game with our worthy adversaries, the Northampton Saints, and um, Big Salakai, the Polynesian warlord of great dimensions flies into me, smokes the jaw. I feel a crack. I'm like, oh, I think that's come out in the old mouth guard. <laughs> Pull out. Right, like, so he had a gummy in. <laughs> yeah, had the gummy, had gummy, gummy in. in. Pull the gummy out. <laughs> like, out of it. Because you looked, from the pictures, You, I mean, you look out of it most of the time. Yeah. Most of the time I look across and he's thinking oh. of a question. I'm like, is Max with us? But you looked out of it. Were you all right? It was also, yeah, it was after like, Two heavy attacking oh. sessions in the deep and deep in the red zone. You were just tired. And I was just so tired <laughs> and eviscerated, soul gone, lungs bellowing. <laughs> and I was just sad then, you know. Just like, oh, God, rugby eh? How did game. he knock it out then? With his fist, forearm, uh, shoulder? Yeah, something head? something innocuous like that. And He's no just, red card, no yellow card, nothing. Oh, no, no, no. It was, it was nothing like that. It was just a good old-fashioned jarring of the, of the, of the mandible. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so he's go, whacked yeah. you in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, but I think I've done. Yeah, but he's like he's like six six seven, and I'm like a measly six foot, and I've just kind of like it's more like it was it was like this bit of the arm, like big old bicep or something, just in oh, the in the jaw. Isn't that the rules, guys? Well, I thought, hey, <laughs> listen, I, are you sure they did the HIA stuff properly? Did you get taken off for HIA? No, no, no. Oh no, my so god, no. god, there's a lawsuit coming. Oh gosh, you know. oh no. Well, let's not go into. You're going to lose your doctor. As, right, you're going to lose your doctor. Into the weirds. I don't like it. Doctor <laughs> gone as well as Rad Radra and Piatel. They're leaving. Are you? I know. Sad times. The great, the great prophets, Prophet Radra and Piatel, gone. They're, they're gone. Dust, no more. I know. Hold on, sorry. I know you're going <coughs> to want to move on from this, but what? So no, what just re- tell the people how how have they put that back in your mouth? They just stuck it back in somehow. Oh no! This is this is this is a this is a Let fine no. This is a fine this is a fine porcelain insert. They're not real. So I'll take oh, you. I'll take. Hold on, hold on a minute. <laughs> Show me again. You, it's not okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> now you can see it, can't you? Yeah, like, and now it? you look at it. It's properly. dropped down. It's a lot bigger than the other one. I know, it's not right. <laughs> I know, I have to go back. back to Oi, do you want to bang me out? Yeah. But bang it out the... again. Well, how... it just When it's got set, it didn't get set right, so I've got to go see him again. Hold on, where's your actual tooth? No, 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 this is my actual tooth. So a long time ago, in a bar far, far, far away. <laughs> yes. I was, I was, we were in the revelry of a great night out. It was on a bath social, I was next to a, a certain Benno Urbano, a large, a large gentleman, and he's a hell of a dancer. He was Millie Rocking. You ever seen a Millie Rock? It's like one, two, you swear oh, across. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah, I've, I've got that. my glass. He's Millie Rocking hard, and he Millie Rocks aggressively. That's a big boy, Millie Rocking, right? <laughs> Hits the glass, boom! Completely pulverizes my poor incisor, the, the OG incisor. And then I had to go in Bali. Yeah, I went and got some some dentistry done there to sort what, it were out. Were you in Bali when you got it knocked out? No, no, no. This was, so you waited until was... you got to Bali and get stuck yeah, back yeah, in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, so then... No, no, it wasn't you... fully... Uh, it was like just Sir John Chiptwell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it, wasn't quite, it wasn't quite out of my mouth. But it was so... It was just completely obliterated. It was a vestige of a tooth. It looked nothing like a tooth. And so they've repaired it and they've stuck it back in and now it's bigger than the No, other. no, now it's... This is made of porcelain. This is a fine, fine bit of... Mimicry. So where's your actual tooth that came out your mouth? This one is the one, but it was in the gum shield, so I just got it reinserted with yes, concrete. Yes, you you talk about the tooth that that 
Well, the Benno it? smoke. The Benno yeah. smoke. Oh, no, the rest of it was just destroyed by the ma- the, the, the dentist drill. That was a night out. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And we get to the bottom of it, yeah. Yes. Okay. I know, it's been an absolute my, odyssey. That's a, uh, uh, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to just reset. It's all right. It's just I can't put a, a permanent fixture in because if you put a metal fixture into a jaw, it's not conducive to the great rigours of playing rugby because if your tooth then gets hit, it can cause, like, fractures of the mandible, like like significant ones. Well, that's it. Yeah. So most people that play rugby that have a tooth knock, they just... I, yeah, they just I, have the insert. Boys, they just have the insert. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm so, so used to Pete Murchie, our coach now, I play with him. He's like the front three. Yeah, they and, can just come out like yeah, on a thing. What a great thing it's a to great do when you're drinking. It, yeah. When you're drink, out drinking with the boys, nothing better than be able to take your teeth yeah, out. It does yeah, look like you've got like really bad scars. <laughs> Rather have teeth, though. I don't know. You can <laughs> literally, you. you can literally <laughs> go from. <laughs> I'd rather like, have a set of the pearly whites. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> than banter on a night out. <laughs> then, then, then grandma's. <laughs> yeah, the amount of times I found those in my pint, or like, <laughs> yeah. get them out, and then they're going in people's pints. It does something awful to the symmetry of your face though doesn't it you yeah, take well, some teeth he, out whoa he goes from like a, a normal citizen to junkie within <laughs> yeah. Like exactly. Full. yeah i look yeah. like i just look like i had a bad case of scurvy when no, i think i think it suited you oh, i think it suited enough. you anyway should, we could talk about his tooth all day yeah, we, yeah. Yeah, we could we digress yeah we are now delighted to be joined by uh, the most capped australian rugby player in history their longest serving captain up to, until Michael Hooper, I think. Until Hooper, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> a world champion and absolute legend in George Gregan. Uh, George, thanks for joining us. How's it all going? Yeah, good, thank you. Thank you for having me on the, the podcast. And uh, it's going well, mate. Sort of almost through my first winter over here, so it's all good. You spent a bit of time here? Yeah, I have. So I've so we'll spent more time here during, oh, since June this year, because we've got a health and fitness business, which we, we do, like, um yoga Pilates products and we do sort of um, resistance tubes so there's a couple of brands there but we've been involved with that for about 12 plus years and we're in UK Europe and looking to expand so it makes sense for me to be over here I know I've got to be careful to set them off but yoga and Pilates in rugby now I remember 10 years ago when someone made us do yoga and we all just took the piss it, yeah. like, it was who could fart first yeah 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 now <laughs> <laughs> you know what poor, I mean? Poor, like, poor pelvic floor, yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And like, everyone, <laughs> like a bunch of school kids. It's still like that. I'm not going to lie. It is a bit like that. But yeah. it's moving into rugby. Pilates, yoga, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it Huge is. Huge in our sport. It, it has been big. And I think like, it derives from dancers. So you never see an unfit dancer, do you? They're all, they're all in good nick and they move so athletically, etc. So I think part of that's been adopted into sport and they see the benefits of it. Probably for like, um, I think, Injury prevention, but just keeps you yeah. properly strong and gives you good range of movement. Oh. And it's yeah, it's been it's been pretty popular back home in, in Oz for a while. Like you think of rugby league, you think of rugby union, you think of the big boppers going into each other. But someone like Melbourne Storm, I know they're one of the best performing rugby league teams ever. And like Craig Bellamy and that team, that's that's part of their routine for over a decade. They're really early adopters of it, and I th- particularly they're underage guys. I think they're sort of under twenties. Before they play first grade, they need to have done a good year plus of that Pilates. So their Is body right? keeps them strong and their core strong for the long season ahead. And um, it's really, they have a pretty low injury rate. They have pretty good success, but um, that's all part of it. It's really you interesting. One crap it. You got that sort of stuff, <laughs> don't you? Well, I don't mind it. Yeah, I'll get amongst it. It's quite good fun. Here we are talking Pilates. It's Boys, I mean, this is, you on? can do with it. Yeah, <laughs> I you, know you I can do with it. Absolutely. <laughs> Pointing me out, I'm with three elite athletes and I, I'm the one who needs oh, to do oh, some work, do I? I, I? don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. Um, but I am supposed to move us into slightly more rugby-based chat, if possible. Uh, and you, you played for Eddie Jones, club and country. What was your reaction to England letting him go and then... Uh, the Wallabies signing him up uh, very, very quickly after. Yes, it was really strange, wasn't it? I think it shocked everyone, but from being putting the Aussie hat on, I'm really happy that Eddie's back in Australia um, rugby. It's fantastic for us. I think everyone's talking rugby, but then it, it's a results-based business, isn't it? And um, I think now Ian Borthwick's had a great career as an assistant coach working under Eddie at Japan and, we, and with... Um, with England, and he's done a great job as a head coach with Leicester, but it's just a different animal now. He's the gaffer now, isn't he? So yeah, he, he's, it. um, <laughs> he, it's his yeah. responsibility, and um, it, it's 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 brutal. It's kind of ruthless in terms of just so results-driven, and if you don't get it, you get moved on. 
Um, and fair play, not whilst we're talking about it, fair play to Scotland with um, Gregor Townsend because I think there's been always those murmurings at times, yeah. but they've, they've stuck with him. And I'm, I'm being a fan, the way they're playing, and obviously I'm showing my age, I played against Gregor and I just loved how he played. He was one of those guys who could play flat and attack. It's very intelligent how he played, and you see lots of that coming through with the Scottish play. Over a period of time, surrounding with the right group of players, preparing in a certain way, it takes time, but then you see the results. So, yeah, it's, it's a hard one, but international sport's tough like that. Do you think it's weird that England didn't have that same clause that I think Dave Rennie has got, the no-compete clause? Do you think it was weird they didn't put that on Eddie Jones? Yeah, I think the no-compete, it's pretty pretty bizarre, I think, for a coach. You're sort of denying them. Where, where could he compete? Um, are you talking about international rugby? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just surprised that England just allowed him to go out there and coach another team that could potentially co- play against them in a World Cup. Yeah, well, we sort of did that. The Wallabies did that in 2005, said goodbye. Um, by 2007, he's coaching assistant coach with um, South Africa right. with uh, Jake White, coaching. We didn't get we weren't good enough to get 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 to meet them. We got knocked out by England in the quarter final, but potentially we would have been um, playing against Eddie. So you talk about rugby IP, you know, yeah, part of that's gone to wherever he's coached. But I think that's that's the beauty of rugby. I think I think if you stop international coaches applying their trade elsewhere, then the game doesn't necessarily grow. Um, and I think what he's done, and I'll use him as an example, like Robbie Deans, he's in Japan doing a great job. Um, he coached New Zealand. He didn't coach the All Blacks. Then we got him across. We got the Crusaders saying, you can't go over international rugby because you've got New Zealand rugby IP from coaching the Crusaders. One of the, I think that's I, – I, I, I personally, I don't like that because I think it's really important that quality people, quality coaches get to apply their trade wherever they can because I think whoever they go to is going to benefit from it and ultimately the game grows from it. Be inter- it happening. will be very interesting though, won't it? It'll be very interesting. England meet Australia in a... Oh, it's going to be tested. It's- also, and George, it- we've had a couple of people on the show who've, who've got who were kind of <laughs> isolated away from that England squad under Eddie who were given a chance they're not given and mm. you can imagine there's going to be scores to settle if it does end up in that in, yeah. in, a, in a sort of oh. knockout game eh? yeah definitely oh, there'll be lots of, we're talking about it now it's a, it's a fair way away there's a bit of rugby to be played between now and that potentially occurring um, but yeah everyone's got a different relationship with uh, their head coach or their coaches plural Mm, but um, I think that it will be spicy. But on the flip side, which I find always interesting with Eddie, you never hear the people who he's really, like, he's changed their careers. He's changed, he's given them an opportunity to, to become international players or beyond that a super rugby player. And a lot of people don't see it, but he sees it and he challenges it and, and brings the best out of that player over time by giving them the tools. And he, yeah, I can tell you so many stories of that, having seen it, being part of it. Um, but it's it's really interesting. I think great coaches do that. He's definitely a great coach. You mentioned someone like Dave Rennie. He's a great coach too in terms of that. I think coaches are teachers and um, not everyone like their teacher. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are there any that come off the top of your head that you're thinking, you know, he really did have an, an impact? And I think Jim Williams is a good example for me. Jimmy Williams was a winger playing for Ringer Rats where... Gregor Townsend played with Abdul Benazir. They came over and had a season playing in Australia and enjoying the Northern Beaches and applying their trade. And the Forex um, Gold? Yeah. But, well, was, <laughs> no, not not in New South Wales. No. Oh, it would be to his new mate. To his new. Is that too bogan, is it, the Forex Gold? No, Forex well, is up in Queensland. Queensland. To, to his oh, new. Yeah. 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 Down in Melbourne, oh. the Carlton Draft. He's just getting that East Coast sort of <laughs> flavour. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's no worries, mate. <laughs> um, but with Jimmy Williams, he came from Baringa, the Ringa Rats, as a winger. He's having the one-on-one, and Eddie sort of said to him, you know, mate, Jimmy, you're going to come down here. He says, what, what do you want to do in terms of position you want to play? He says, oh, I want to be a wing. He says, well, that's going to be a struggle for you because we've got Joe Roth. I think we had a young Bar- Mark Bartholomew. We had, we had some good wingers going around. He's saying, so, mate, you're not going to come down here and play as a winger. I'm going to make you into a world-class number eight. So he, he kind of laughed a bit, Jimmy, oh, come on. And he says, no, 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 look, you kind of play number eight sort of sevens which isn't number eight, but like in the forwards, he says, you move really well, you've got good skills, really fast, strong, athletic, hand, handling's going to be really good. I said, we're going to turn you into a number eight, world-class number eight. He couldn't believe it, but then he put a program and said, you're going to put on X amount of kilos, you're going to do this in the training, and we're going to work you as a back row, you're going to learn from this, and he was really good. He had all this athletic speed around, so running back rower, 
could pick and drive quick to the ball, had good handling skills, and ended up becoming a, a member of the Wallabies, which won the 99 World Cup. So, like, that's the story. It doesn't get told a lot, but that's, yeah. that's Jim Williams. He transformed him from a club player as a winger into a, yeah. a World Cup winning number yeah. eight. And it's, it's amazing how he, he, he'll back that person, he'll give them that picture and he'll give them the tools to go there. Um, but, no, I think there's lots and lots of those types of stories. Do you reckon Eddie Jones, in your experience, may have crushed a lot of, not a lot of, some players, like fledgling professionals? He coaches hard. Yeah. Uh, um, and not everyone um, like can be coached hard. And he's, he's evolved. I was coached by Eddie in 97, 98. 98 when he took over the Brumbies and I was coaching my last year with Eddie in Japan which was with Suntory and the evolution he's no different to a player he evolves and there's a softer edge to Eddie compared to say 20 odd years ago but he's he's going to challenge his players he'll want them he want them lean strong focus preparing um as well as they possibly can um to to go and perform as consist- consistently as they can and make decisions. Like, he's really big on passing that on to the, the leadership group, which I really do like. But I think he's, he's um, I've, I've said it before, he's the best coach I had. And I think that's that word leadership group and, and your core leaders are really, really important to work with the coaches and to work with the playing group to make sure the messaging is um, all based around that consistent performance and getting better. And, and if, if you drop off that stuff... It just comes back and bites you so badly, and yeah. you go, "Wow, we, we, we didn't. <laughs> we we probably should have brought that up at the time. We probably because we, we were missing that at practice. So if you're missing it at practice, you're missing it during the games, all that kind of thing. So yeah, I think the yeah that that approach from Eddie is um, it gets results. Does it get long term results for certain personalities? Maybe not. Um, but I think. Does he has he really improved? I think his his man management, but I think he's always been really good with promoting leaders to make decisions on the field. I think that's never going to change with Eddie. He really hands it over to the leadership group to take responsibility. Then he puts his hand up and he'll take full responsibility for the performance. But no, I think that's that's the strength of the man. Uh, take you back to 2003, uh, Eddie James at the helm. He decides to get you all together for an infamous pre World Cup training camp to Arnhem Land. Can you tell us what unfolded during the trip? Where's, that, where's Arnhem Land? Northern Territory. Yeah, so Arnhem Land, we didn't get around the beers. It's a it's sort of, the, the, to finish off the tour, you're up in Northern Territory and they've, all their beers are always cold because it's always very hot. Um, that that part of well, Northern Territory, there's so many, um, it's part of the oldest parts of the world, but particularly Arnhem Land. And we got, we've taken on a tour, we, we've taken into some caves where some of the, the imagery was like 60,000 plus years. Oh, like it's the oldest civilization, unbelievable. And so you're looking at a sunset, and it's kind of like, wow, this is amazing. This is painted sixty thousand years ago, and so from a spiritual perspective, it really, really, really hit the team. And the guides are amazing, and um, we sort of finished on the last day, going on a bit of a, a sunset sort of cruise to sort of have a bit of a look on these boats, um, and see the sun go down. And then there's this beach full of just these crocodiles. And the story unfolds where you got your your bus or your, your boat full of <laughs> the, the mischievous crew, the guys. The, the different. You got you always got different personalities in teams, don't you? The guys Absolutely. and the guys are up to mischief. Always going to connect. The ones who are kind of semi sensible, <laughs> but like sort of also <laughs> no. I probably want to be on the safe boat if they're going to be mucking yeah. around and they're going to draw some extra attention. I kind of don't want to be on that Which boat. Which boat are you on, Max? You're safe, Daniel. You're, you're, you're safe. I mean, where I'm Where are fucked. you, mate? You're I'm on the party, but you're, you? you're on the party boat. Nah, I don't know too much about Arnhem Land. I'd definitely be on the safe man's boat, and the boat would be huge and be manned of harpoon gun. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anywhere, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I would be anywhere near the loose units oh, on that trip, yeah, so bro. easily so, loose. We're talking about, like, 15 feet man-eating reptiles from the crustaceous period of Jurassic. World, mate. <laughs> the oldest predator you're yeah, talking about, exactly. like, and smart, and it's, they've been around. Yeah. It's not their first rodeo they in check terms the of, habits of out. and yeah. they're big. They're really big. Like they're here at the door, long, man, that's like some thick, back. and it's they're nah, just it, massive. Yeah. And the guide gave the wrong dis- wrong information. He told them the distress call about a young croc, which is away from its parents, was like, uh, uh, like that yeah, sort of yeah, noise, yeah. Uh, uh, like that. <laughs> so what's the what's 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 the loose? Yeah. Boat do. Oh, I'm going. Uh-uh. It's just doing, doing that it. whole thing. Then all of a sudden, these these crocs, which hadn't moved at all, st- start turning around. Getting a bit stimulated. Getting stimulated. 
and then it feels like we're in between it and where that noise is coming from because oh. they think someone on the silly boat no is the child. And they go for this boat, which was making the no. noise. It's, it's your kiddos, it's your, it's your Wendell Sailors. It's, 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 <laughs> I'm telling you, I'd be... It's your be, uh, uh, it's, yeah. Maddie, it's just all of those guys. Fuck. And sure enough... Damn leagueies. They're, they're jumping across. <laughs> and the boat's tipping. Nah. Nah. Then you see the guys who... It's, oh, nah. they're, they're going towards you, so you know we're going to push you up. So it sort of stays, stays sort of just up. But it could have tipped over and... Glenn Eller, who was our backs coach, attack coach at the time, he came over here with Eddie as well. He he ca- he hey. caught the moment, and it was <laughs> it was it was chaos. We nearly lost half the team, um, in, in that moment. And prior to that, we obviously did a couple of hard days work up in um, up in Darwin, and everyone was like hit all their numbers physically in the best nick of their life. They would have tasted good. The Crocs would have had the leanest, freshest tasting Venison. Wallaby team, or yeah. well, half of it anyway. Um, Pre World Cup, so that didn't occur, thank goodness. But yeah, it was one of those moments. That's yeah. <laughs> you spoke to those guys from that group. I think they always remember Arnhem Land for um, pretty much for that moment. Well, that, that <laughs> preseason, to, well, it must have worked, right? Because mm. the Wallabies then did have an incredible World Cup, uh, caused a massive upset by beating at the time the, the All Blacks in the semi final. See the most famous moment from that game, uh, the ultimate sledge to Byron Kelleher. Byron was a feisty little halfback. He was a good player. Played for the obviously All Blacks and the Highlanders. And it was an in-your-face kind of halfback. Um, and like, was, you just knew his presence. And he was good on his feet. Was but he, he almost he almost sort of made, he made a lot of noises on the field too. Like he'd be throwing, but he'd like he'd be doing all this sort of stuff. And <laughs> and he like he was that typical night, and, <laughs> and, and then he'd, and he'd say night. things like before the game on a go off like a can of fizzy coke, like a fuzzy coke, and all this sort of that's stuff. That's not bad. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Like, and, and <laughs> he, he was, but he he could play, but he he was he, like being honest, he was he was an annoying guy to play against, and. Part of his charm was was all of that, but he hung on to things. So, like, he made a mistake, he, he'd be thinking about that for a while. <laughs> and um, so, he was like as good as he was. Like, if he did make an error, like you could, he wasn't a goldfish, and so you could potentially point out that he made a few errors, and and you know that's going to play on him for a little bit. <laughs> and um, we got to the World Cup final, no semi final. Marshy, my good mate, but he's good, great competitor. But he, they ran this play. Marshy's probably still filthy, competitive man, good mate. But he's probably laughing, but he probably still is really filthy about it. Um, they ran this play off the exit, like a four-man insert. So the the hooker throws it to him. He's standing at ten. He ran across and he 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 switched the great and late Jerry Collins. And they've been doing this exit play for nearly eighteen months with success. Get towards midfield. They got a left footer, right footer, and they just clear. So we get to the semi-final, you do your tape and everyone, okay, we know they're going to go to that four-man insert, it's going to go to Marshy, JC's on the inside, okay. And most of the time, even if you waited for Jerry Collins, like Jerry Collins was a bit of a, he was, he was part of the concrete 15, like, you know what I mean? Like, he was, he was built of concrete. Like, he, and he, like, <laughs> he, he, people would break their shoulders trying to tackle him. So he was, he was just tough. He was really hard, JC. Beautiful man, beautiful human being. Yeah, what a special human being. But um, we said, well, why would we let Marshy just have that time we want to drop off JC? Um, why don't Georgie, as in Georgie Smith, not me, Georgie, <laughs> what, wouldn't it be a good idea if you just put a bit of line speed and really just sm- look to just smash him? With or without the ball? <laughs> oh, with the ball. Wow. But, like, he's going to run that skinny switch. So that's what happened. So he throws it. He's just as he's about to throw it. Georgie's just left and bangs and... Clocked him, got him really good because he's like a little switch. You sort of got your yeah, side of your body exposed. You can't really see that. So Georgie's got him pretty good, and um, and he played on till half time. But he had bad ribs. Like he couldn't play. He yeah. couldn't play the second half. It cooled down. He couldn't. Play. So Byron comes on, and um, proceeds to not play. I think at the same level as Marshy. Proceeds to make a few errors. Um, the match is sort of pretty tight, and it's getting to that point where. It's close. It's never mate, there, ten points is never really enough against New Zealand. But it's getting, it's winding down, and they have made another error, and they've just they they, they have, they've lost their mojo a bit. And it's just that moment where he's made that error. I'm coming off the bottom of the ruck. Little did I know would it change now if I thought those cameras were on me at the time. But like it's like, and you just you just met, yeah, you let him know. 
the cycle. Let him walk. know the cycle of a World Cup, which is a four-year cycle, <laughs> and <laughs> just you let him. It was no. just directed at Byron, but the cameras and, and every Kiwi to this moment and he, to this day they still just... they still think it's directed at him. <laughs> but I had a few of those all by saying that was a good call. Like that was that was <laughs> play on. Like there's always a bit of that. On yeah, the field. Yeah. Like, you know, it's like good for the game. it's like I was never on the end of it. Like the I was like, seriously. It's beautiful. <laughs> well, yeah. It was a moment. It was a moment. It was captured between myself and Byron, but the cameras interfered, and I actually worked with that cameraman at Fox Sports. So like he says, you know, I got that shot. I said, you know, you're the one to blame. Why did you zoom in on that? <laughs> they, they've got long memories as well. The Kiwis, because uh, I think it was the 2011 World Cup semi-final, and it was like 60,000 people chanting four more years. That's it. That was it. That was, I was with Eelsie commentating. I had the whole of Eden Park just like chanting and. Four more years. Yeah, that was <laughs> like it. a presidential rally. <laughs> yeah, it was quite. It was quite interesting. Yeah, it was definitely. Were you bad for Sledger? Were you, you, I mean, you're a nine, so you must have been a bit chirpy. Yeah, a bit chirpy, but yeah. like not like everyone talks about. It's part of your chat. Like, what well, was funny? Other than that, I think we played the final the next week. Doors tried to use that on me. I think at some point I said, Doors, come on, you've got to come up with some own. You've got to come up with your own chat. Get your own material, mate. Come on, Doors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see a perfect response. Yes. Yeah, I get you. Speaking I get of that game, that. though, what, what are your recollections of the 2003 World Cup final? Martin Johnson and that crew, the Leicester boys in that four, like definitely Harden, Warwick, Johnny Wilkinson kicking, all that stuff. He was tough. Like he was, he was mentally tough, but physically very strong too. Um, but he was carrying a bad right shoulder. We knew that, and he went down. I think pretty early in that World Cup, and we thought he was he was gone, but. Um, you saw it, I think, probably two years prior to that. He was probably almost gone in the second uh, British and Irish Lions test and yeah. he plays the next week. So he's 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 strong, strong of strong of will, strong mind, strong of character. So I think maybe in the modern day, Tins, my good mate Tins would be red carded when he tipped that me on my head. Yeah, yeah, that one. There we if go, that was the one I was going to ask. That was, yeah, that, that was a bit of a hit. Yeah, that was the one. He would have, like, his tip beyond thing. thingo, like, oh, the ball was over. I'd sort of, I'd kind of given up and I'm... Like seventy eight kilograms being wet by that stage, I think. I was always trying to cheat my um my weight. But um he yeah, he got me. And I remember it was a back he came over and gave me a golf full as well. It was good. Like that was kind of we had, it was a really strong English team over that period, a really strong and we went we went at it really hard, which is which is kind of nice. But yeah, in in the modern day that's yeah, tins is red carded. Yeah, Tins is a filthy player, my <laughs> <laughs> Everything's very calm now. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Back in my day. Was it was yeah. it not as hard of a defeat to take? And I'm sure, of course, it's a World Cup final, but having you'd been there, you'd climbed the summit, mm. was there an element of, wow, this we, we were part of an amazing spectacle at home? Uh, maybe post. It takes a while. Like you, you knew you were some, part of something special, but the, the something special would have been what New Zealand did in 2015, we could have done in 2003, gone back to back. So we, knew, we were fully aware of that. No one had done that in World Cup history at that stage. And um, we, we knew what we were chasing. And we weren't defending the World Cup. We were going to win it because you can't, like, that was just our attitude because it's a different, 99's different, totally different set, set of circumstances, different group of players, etc. But we're all very focused on trying to create that bit of history with that team and go back to back. So, you know, the, yeah, our form was very inconsistent leading into it but we we knew we could beat anyone on any given day um but it was a matter of being prepared for that tournament which is a different tournament like it's like when we get to france in fast forward a few months no one's really going to care about like i I love the six nations and i love what's going to happen in britain no one's really going to care about that once you get to quarterfinals it's like who turns up today like it's front up all you know pack your bags and go home it's you don't really experience that in any other competition you play except the world cup um, or particularly that intensity. There's knockout footy you play, but that's that's the reality of it. So we were prepared well for that. Um, but, um, you know, we we got to extra time. And we, like, I wish Johnny had probably kicked that maybe a minute and a half earlier than he did. But they managed the clock pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, how did you deal with coming into the, the Wallaby squad as a young man? When there were such legendary figures in there, and you know, particularly someone like David Campese, must yeah. have been quite terrifying. You know, <laughs> you know, was he a bad? I think you roomed with him. Was he a bad roommate? Was he a bit of a bully? How was he? I played 
94 with Campo, but I think I played with an Aussie Sevens with Dave Wilson, Tim Hoare and Jason Little Campo. It was a pretty handy Sevens team. But played against a, a handier New Zealand team, which had Dallas Seymour, a guy called the late John Lomer, What a He was 18 at this stage. Christian Cullen was a few years later. Thank goodness we didn't have to play him in sevens. It was bad enough playing him in fifteens. Um, but they just had an awesome sevens team. And Gordon Titchen's first tournament, and they, they beat us in the final. But, yeah, we'd got to um, – and I was rooming with Ili Tambua. It was like he coached Fiji. He's a great uh, wallaby back rower in that 93 season uh, when they beat uh, Springboks from behind. It, like just, just – I, I was pinching myself. And they were just all great guys, and they had very Aussie, but I think all good teams is that on-off button when you switch on, like lock-in and all that kind of stuff. When you switch off, let's enjoy our time off, let's go and have a few beers, or let's go and have a meal together, let's go to the standing markets in Hong Kong, whatever it is. And so we were, like I just embraced that, and they were good, and they looked after you, but I was the youngest, so I was always copying a, copying a little bit, but of a lot of jokes. Um, but yeah, Campo, Campo was... Yeah, Campo's Campo. I think you've all heard different stories. He's all about him. Uh, one thing I'll say from a <laughs> from a professional perspective in an amateur, he was like amazing. Like his work ethic, working on all his skills. Um, maybe not as much on defence, but that's all right. He he his kicking game, his passing game, his skill set, his ability to see stuff that no was world class. He was a game changer. But as a roommate, but as a roommate, he's all about Campo. So he's a guy who, if he couldn't sleep, he just turned the lights on. And you're, like, I'm a good sleeper. Like I, I, you probably need to put a light like that to wake me up. But like it kind of, sort of was. I'm going, hey, what's go- what's going on? Was it like a fire alarm or something? No, mate, I can't sleep. Okay. <laughs> so we both can't sleep. It's <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, but I was. I, there's a guy called Ricky Stewart who I played. I never played with Ricky. Gosh, he's he's a great um, rugby union player as a schoolboy, one of the best schoolboy junior rugby players ever um, as a halfback and played 10 as well. But then he went to rugby league, went to the Raiders. He's coaching the Raiders now, played for the Kangaroos, was a dual international. Um, went on an 87 tour, I think, to Argentina. So he was going to be the next young halfback, but obviously had a, would have had some some difficulty because there's a guy called Nick Far jones who was pretty handy. Um, so he, he told me, because he played with uh, Campo, where you go, mate, he's all about camp. I played with him. He says, if he, he'll come hard at you like he did with me at Queen and Whites, telling you this and that and give him the ball all the time. He says, mate, your job, give it to the 10. You'll give it to him from time to time, but he'll just want it all the time. If he doesn't, he'll carry on. He'll give you a lot of shit and he'll, be, he'll, just, he'll come at you. And if he comes at you too hard, mate, just tell him to fuck off. <laughs> I said, okay, Ricky, thank you. I said, that? He said, no, seriously, just remember that. And so that moment came and... Then the morning time, one of the t- stages, it was like, man, are you going to go get me some breakfast? Like, get me some fruit. You get out of breakfast, yeah. I'm having a, I'm having a little bit of a sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the night. It's been time to sleep. And now you, you want me to get your breakfast? Yeah, yeah. I said, well, just leave it outside the door. You can get... Was, that's when... <laughs> how let's old go you? forth and multiply. I was 21. And how old was he? 34, I think, around that stage. That's what I was. Yeah, that was it. So that was, that was my Campo experience. George, let's... um. Talk a little bit about probably one of the single moments, I guess, in your career that that might have laid the path for uh, the amazing career that you had. That try saving tackle on Jeff Wilson that meant that Australia actually ended up winning the Bledisloe Cup, and it is remembered as one of the greatest moments in the Wallabies All Blacks uh, rivalry. Talk us through it and and what it actually meant to you. That match in Sydney in 1994. I think it was still probably, I probably got beaten last year, the best rating um, free-to-air um, rugby match. It was like one of the best sporting events until obviously State of Origin. So State of Origin is the other code, rugby league, and that's the biggest, yeah. that's just the massive TV audience. Um, so we sort of copied that. Let's do a Wednesday night, great audience. People are used to it. Tune in, pretty handy Wallaby team at that stage. We won the World Cup in 91 and, yeah, that, that's an amazing team. And so I was lucky enough to be part of that. And we're playing the All Blacks in a one-off Bledisloe midweek. Like you're sort of pinching yourself thinking about it. I'm turning up and like all these guys I've watched when I was at uni having a few beers with all mate playing cards or whatever it was. They've won World Cups. Yeah. They've beaten they've beaten um, South Africa in South Africa. They've beaten South Africa in Australia being one down. And then all of a sudden you're in the changes with them and then you're being barked at for not 
not telling him to do your job, like get in position, Kearns, all that kind of stuff. It was pretty amazing. Then you're playing the All Blacks, like all the guys who you've watched on TV, your Bunsies, Walter Little, Zinzan Brook, you know, you've got Fitzy, a young, a young Jeff Wilson. Uh, like it was you know, Bashup, like just an amazing team. Like there's never a <laughs> – there's never a bad or black team, is there? There's always a superlative, but that was a pretty amazing team. And, yeah, we we got off to a flyer. I think David Knox put up a high ball. Jace Little shows his athleticism, scores, bang. Kernsey scores around the corner. I think it's 17-0 after about 20 minutes, but they, they come back like they always do. And mm. then it comes down to this play where they go from one side of the field, Zinni throws his traditional 30 metres, a zip pass, which bounce, whatever it is. They found space as they always can. And then Jeff Wilson, young Jeff Wilson, steps about five and I'm just covering. I'm just doing my but like he's missed. I probably I'm not having this conversation if one of those guys does does their job and makes a tackle. <laughs> I'm not giving it to those guys. But like honestly, I'm just there at the right time and I'm I just throw everything at it and that's a once in a lifetime tackle. And then I played Jeff many times after that. And Jeff had stepped everyone, but he went for that corner. He stepped me every other time we played. Like that's it scenario. Like he just he had, he had such good footwork. He guy could play basketball. Like he was an incredible athlete. But I mean, yeah, that was that was that was the moment. And um, I think I've met so many people. Oh, I was in the corner that night. Like that stadium has been rebuilt, and it's about forty five thousand or forty Where under was fifty it, Sydney Football Stadium. Oh, okay. So they've refurbed it. And I reckon I've spoken to probably the, the size of that stadium of people who are in that corner. Everyone. I said, it must have been a really, it must have been a funny <laughs> stadium. Like, yeah, stadium. It's just this oh, really, of course, yeah. you, of course you're in that corner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was a, yeah, it was a pretty special occasion. Yeah. George, you got to play against uh, Jane Alomu a few times. Was he as terrifying, as incredible as, as he's now remembered? Yeah, he was just, he was a colossus, Jonah. Wow. Like, just thinking of it, like, you was really fortunate to play. I played him at the peak of his powers. And the peak of his powers, remember, because he was on dialysis from a, right from the get-go, he was, he was never better than 80% of, of his physical ability because of that. And they managed that really, really well all through his career. Um, but going to Hong Kong Sevens, there was, uh, you'd, they'd had big wingers. They'd had Inga Tui Gamala, um, like Damien Smith for Australia. I'm not comparing, but he was a big, tall, six-foot-plus winger. But the island, the Islander boys are like super athletic, super fast, but nothing like Jonah. Jonah played number eight at schoolboys, and it's running off the back. And but and then you've got him as this number eight playing on the wing. He's over. He would have been nearly one hundred and ten kilos then. Back then, yeah, he, and he got to probably closer to one twenty. So he was he was eighteen. So you know when you're eighteen, you get an idea, like, or you get a sense that okay, what's he going to be like when he's twenty three? Like when he's fully developed and he's in a full training mode, which he kind of was. But like then was incredible. I remember in that final, I still remember it, we we kicked it off and they went split split and they went across, and I've gone across to make a cover tackle, and it was a good tackle. I like got. Got under his fan, boom, chopped his legs, squeeze, you know, that whole thing, get it together, heads yeah. in the right position, squeeze. And I said, okay, I'm thinking timber, baby. He's coming down. <laughs> Eyes closed. But no, honestly, like I put a good shot on him, like bang, and squeeze. And then I'm holding onto this boot. <laughs> it's about a size 14 Adidas friggin' cope or whatever it is, man. And then he's just running down the field with one sock. It was a black sock with a white. Oh, I and thought I, you were stuck to his leg. But no, 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 no. Boot. I've just got his boot. I'm going, and I've looked at that and I went, I actually couldn't have, I actually executed a really good tackle. Uh, I said, what, who is this bloke? Like, I, I've tackled a few people. Like, I, it wasn't my first tackle. And I was thinking, wow. So, <laughs> is that the first time you come across him? Yeah, first time I came across him, and, and that's when I realised you actually can't go. When he's in full stride, no. you couldn't go low on him. It was, it was impossible because he was so big and strong through here and his stride length, and if you were like, he just couldn't, you couldn't get him together. That, that was, was like thing. a Tangeli Naivoru. Yeah. Do you remember him who plays for us? We played with him in Glasgow, and I remember watching him like run that, and, but there was just nothing people could do. They yeah. were just like big dude. just throwing their selves at their feet, just hoping he's almost tripped over them. That's yeah. what. Yeah. But he but he could beat you in an in and out too. He yeah, had incredible team, he speed. Just, he was only straight. No, so Jonah could he could he could play in, play out, beat you with his big fend. He could obviously run over the top of you, as many people discovered. 
Um, and he he didn't have he didn't have the the big step. It was he was real swervy. He had he he moved so beautifully for a big man. Like he was he was he was poetry in motion. But then he was just also he could be just a destructive wrecking ball. What was he like off the field? Beautiful he, man, he catch beautiful human being. Stuff off the yeah, he would things. drink too much, but he was just a lovely, gentle soul. Yeah, you know, how's your family? How's it like what kind of stuff? I remember seeing him just prior to obviously him passing away. It was that off the the World Cup final on the sidelines, and we're doing our we're doing some stuff. I was doing stuff with Fox Sports and interviewing Brody Retallick and the. And the All Black guys congratulating him. And he's there doing some stuff. I think he was working pretty hard with Heineken. And we're just chatting away. And he actually looked really well. I'd seen him a number of years. And I said, geez, good to see you, Johnny. Looking really, really well. And he's like, and just wanting to know about the family, wanting to know this, mm. chatting. Just a beautiful human being. Um, a real loss. And would do anything for anyone. That's, I don't think he could play, pay a bigger compliment. And, and all the All Blacks would have just got great Jonas stories, but he, he's the kind of guy, you know, if there's a one-up story, like you should have a chat to some of the, the, the All Black boys, but his one-up story wasn't meant to be. He just, he could, you know, such and such, well, I can get you like this, the latest yeah, DJ. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of, and he would, and he goes, and then rocks up, and then he goes, yup. That's yeah, kind of, but he was, yeah. he was such a beautiful human being. Um, I'd love, I would have loved to have had a, had a chance to play the game with him. It would have been great to play with, but um, unfortunately he was always on the other side. Most of the time, saying yours. Yeah. <laughs> Do you reckon he'd be as dominant? Would he, as he is now in the modern game? Would he be as dominant in the modern game? Um, the way the players are now, from a, just the physical conditioning, but also just defensively, really good. One to fifteen, their spacing, like one of the days where like you'd almost have all Honey the forwards sort of stuff. like just yeah. running, like just not wanting to be holding this. But, oh gosh, what are you doing? Not wanting to be able to touch their friend type thing. Mm. It's 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 harder. Space is hard to find. Like you talk about the buzzword collision or winning the contact, actually breaching the line, breaking a seam, like all these things, like it was line breaks. Yeah. But you didn't see a lot of line breaks. Like that try that Ireland scored against um France off that restart where they where they, they restart, centre field, went back and that was obviously a great set piece, but you don't see a lot of that. Like yeah. uh, they're they're few and far between. Um so his impact on the game would be Probably not as much, but it's always hard to compare. He's just quality. Yeah. yeah. Um. I'm see Julian Severe when he was at his at his pomp in 2015. He took a lot of stopping. They called him the bus, but Jonah was another level to Julian yeah, Severe. Like, and Julian yeah. was amazing. Like, it's always hard. Like, but quality players. I use. I use. Um. Like I mentioned, people like Todd Kefu. I use a guy like Zinzan Brook. Different era. Just quality players. They'd find a way. Would they have the same impact? Um, on the game, I don't know. It's very hard. They'd have an impact because they're just quality. Yeah. It's like I love golf. Tiger twenty years ago, to how he's playing now was he? If he's well, he's not that healthy, but he can still. The modern still games, yeah. the, the modern games changed. Um, the modern players are prepared differently. They're more athletic and everything. But can he still compete and get the job done? Yeah, he still can. It's just a different. Mm. It's a different era. But quality is quality. Um, and. Channel was definitely quality. But, yeah. You mentioned Survivor. there. What do you reckon of this one? This yeah, week? I'm, I'm one week like week it's enough. been done. I just think it's been done. Like it's one of those pieces which is, yeah, he's regretted. Like what can you do? Like I didn't, like no, he, he was, he not. owned it straight away and job's done and I can't see him doing that again. With that though, George, can you name as, as yourself, as we've discussed it, uh, Tiny bit of a trippy sort of number nine, which it was directed at a fellow number nine of your number yes, nine's sir. union. If there was one player in the current world rugby that you wouldn't want to do that to you individually, who would that be? Artie's kind of like he's pretty. It's, 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 the, but, but it's the ones who don't do a lot of things. They're the ones you worry about. The quiet ones. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like yeah, the smiling assassins or the quiet assassins. Um, oh, in my time, I wouldn't want someone like Jono. Doing that, Martin Johnson. He, he, he was, I was always running behind my pack with John Over. Imagine it's Jerry good. Collins, but you don't oh. know Jerry Collins off the field, and he gives you one of them. Yeah, Jerry was, but Jerry was um, a he was a bit bloke. of a smiling. He, Jerry would just he just whack you, like, <laughs> yeah, he uh, like gay, legally, yeah. like yeah. with his concrete shoulder. <laughs> like just, people just go, yeah, he'd sort of he'd find a way. I, I don't know. I, I I'm probably more wary of the person who doesn't show it. 
And there's a sense, there's, there's a bit of an edge. There's a Dirty Harry edge to them. If you're showing my age, there's a Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry <laughs> feel to them. And you go, okay, okay, I, I sense I may have overstepped the mark. <laughs> okay. And I, I apologise. <laughs> Who would yours be, boys? Mine would be someone like from just from seeing the peanut gate on the on the bus that time with um, Shalva, Mamuka Yashvili, who mm. um, was a bald hooker from Georgia. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah, think I, yeah, no, I think most Georgian. Yeah, most from one Georgia, to eight on their back. They, yeah, you, I you think it'd be like oh. Gogoski, I reckon. And one, I think it's <laughs> Hoggard throwing a pack of peanuts down the bus and it hit him in the back of the head. But I don't think he meant to do it. And, and everyone's him. laughing. Oh, yeah. He just oh. turned around and didn't say anything. Turned back. And we're like. <laughs> he's gonna fucking kill you, mm. and he literally straight after Hoggy and never fucking threw peanuts at me again. Like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah those yeah. guys. He are different. was yeah, silent assassin type. Yeah, yeah. You, you get a sense. Team? It's him. It's it's Gorgoski or Halafir. Halafir is the guy I played with, and he was most. I just came out of school, and I'd never met a person who dealt with confrontation like him, <laughs> and with the sort of physical attributes that the Tongan man possessed. Mm. A great, great man. I love Langy, him dearly, Langy, but Hapo my Kui. God, I wouldn't want him as an <laughs> yeah, enemy. The Tongans would be up there as well, wouldn't they? Yeah, bro. Yeah. Right, yeah. bring it back round to your time. After the 2007 World Cup, you joined Toulon yeah. uh, for a season. Yourself, ultimate professional athlete in your own right. Shocked at all by how we've heard the relaxed, perhaps, attitude uh, to conditioning and training and nutrition that, that was in bit, France back then? A little bit, but at the same time, you know, was, I, I kind of was fortunate to finish my career. It's sort of a, a, like in France, which I didn't expect to, and then finished in Japan. And like, Japan was very professional and they're very deliberate and uh, so particularly at Suntory, it's a world-class facility and a great program. But it was, it was kind of relaxed as much as, which was kind of nice. Didn't have the the focus and the pressure of super rugby and international rugby. There was a level of expectation. If you go to Toulon, you've been to Stade Mail. There's, there's a level of expectation if you play for Toulon to play and win there, um, which was nice. And, and But you felt part of that community. But, yeah, that, that kind of relaxed. There was, they were in pro de deux. Uh, second division, um, a lot of us had just come out of a, playing a World Cup. Like Victor just won a World Cup with South Africa. Um, Anton Oliver with the All Blacks. I'd come from the Wallaby program. Dan Luger was there. Um, he played, obviously, many test matches for England. Uh, he also um, had Mertz. Mertz had, had played for the All Blacks maybe a year prior to – or a couple of years prior to that um, with the All Blacks. And he was playing overseas – world-class players who, who knew what a professional environment looked like and they didn't have – they want to try and replicate that. They did. I think once we left, I think they put some investment into it and improved the facility, which was fine. But I didn't mind that. But, like, you just had to go out and, and, and prepare, like, how you'd like to outside of it because it wasn't um, necessarily at RCT's training facility. Um, but that was fine. For the Frenchies, what I did love was you go out there, you train, you do your bit. A little coffee machine, you have your morning breakfast. Savas so Savas, so everyone shakes hands and says that every single morning, which was beautiful. And you have some nice lunches. It's good. Did, like you, did, the you, local. did you get to a level with any of the geezers when you were doing that? Oh, the kissing, yeah, the always. One two, yeah, you always. There? The one, two. You oh, sit at the front. Beautiful. That's what you do. Okay. You can. Okay. Very French. And so Mertz is very fluent in like a lot of languages, but French is another. Um, Dan Lugues was had a been a lot there. of languages. How many mm. else is he fluent? He can he can speak Italian. Can speak French. Yeah, he could probably, and he can probably, like, if he's here, he could probably announce how to order a beer in about thirteen <laughs> languages or more. But more importantly, those guys just spoke local. They spoke French, mm-hmm. and so when you go out and have meals in the local community, you, you just you, you're speaking French with them, and or I'm learning and I'm hearing it. That was really good. Um, it was a great immersive experience for me and, and our three children. They went to a local French school, so it was amazing. But hey, we got the job done. It was second division and we didn't, like, I think we had to get away from thinking, well, this is the all-black setup, or it's a Wallaby setup, or it's a, no, it's not. It's RCT, we're playing pro to do. Let's, let's roll with it. Let's did adjust. you get promoted that year? Yep. We did the job. We caught ourselves, we still call ourselves the promoters. <laughs> well, because that, was that the first time we've That's been what we call the ourselves. We're the, we're the promoters. So, like, you got your great Johnnies and Gits and Drew, you Apples, yeah. like all of it. Like, they all had a chance. Thanks to you guys. Thanks to the promoters. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I, what, 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 by the way, what an era to be there. Like, imagine, like, you hear of stories of Toulon being 
pretty relaxed and unprofessional, but you were there before. Wait, like, remember when Sonny Bill that. converted? Sonny Bill came after us. I just know, the, just year the year after. after oh, yeah. right. Thanks That's for the was. promoters. Mm. Yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome, Sonny. Bill. You're new. You're out there. You're you should get all the boys together that. during. Bring the brand together. It's like Blues Brothers. Yeah. We're on a mission from God. But, oh, it's so cool, though. Eh? That's so badass. One it. of the things we did bring in post game was, well, it was the protein. We did all that. There was a bit of level of professionalism, don't get me wrong, which was added from us, just which, that, and they adopted. But also, you've got to have cold beers in the change room, win, lose or draw post game and have a beer because we weren't it. Like was that quite a, it was a nice thing which they didn't they didn't do, but then they really appreciated it. So win, lose or draw, we always had a beer together in the change room, which I think is very important. You know, and was yeah. that Murad is it Murad? Is that yeah, yeah. Was yeah. he as crazy what well, he is the yeah, start he's crazy, of his crazy, but he's crazy passionate about too long. Yeah. And he wanted that team to win. He wanted he had a vision like and he spoke about it. He sometimes come in and he'd talk about the rev and and he and he he'd hold court and he spoke about his dream of Toulon becoming French champions, not just in, t- in Top 14 and this, this, and Europe. He, he actually, and he achieved it. He did it. He did and do he it. Yeah. Props, and, eh? and people say, oh, you're a bit bored. Well, he got the players around, but the players were winners and they wanted to, and they had really good local players too as well. And you, you, you create that vision um, and he was passionate about it. And yeah, he, he was quirky. Like I think... There's, he's not the only one who's a, a French owner who's not a little bit quirky. Yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. I think there's a good, good, good deli ticket of them in terms of that. Yeah. You pull it out, what's your number? There's a few of them. Give us yeah. one of his quirkinesses. Though. Surely there was a night out with him. No, look, he, he didn't Would drink he out, he just drank champagne. Like when we were having beer. Oh, so in the change yeah, room, he'd only drink champagne. He Absolutely. said, no, I don't drink beer. I wouldn't have champagne, George. But he had a little sip on a beer when we had, I think, when we were pro to do, when we beat, I think we beat Racing 92, and he had a sip of a beer after we left. That was it. He was pretty happy. But no, he's a champagne man. He liked his ton. He drove it. He was, yeah, he he was unique. And he did the pillow pillow when, even in pro D2. Yeah. Who'd do that again and give it all the pillow pillow stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pillow pillow was big. He used to love that. He'd turn up to training. He was, he, 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 Take my hat off to him in that regard. He was just really passionate and he sold that. And Toulon meant a lot to him. Um, RCT meant meant a lot to him. You go into the office, sometimes you have to go in there to get stuff. And there he was. He'd be working his butt off in there. Have you um, got his number? Office. Would you be able to drop him a text? Like- I don't have my French phone so back in Australia somewhere, but I'd have, I'd have, I'd have that there. Drop him a text, be like, hey, fancy a beer. Yeah, World, Cup, World no, no. Cup coming up. Well, it's not beer. You couldn't do the beer. Oh, sorry. Fancy a glass of champagne. Maybe a horse ale. or beer. Oh, or, or champagne. Oh, yeah, that is so <laughs> No, that is so is, good. Oh, yeah, spot on. <laughs> I, I, read, I read somewhere you turned down a, a contract, uh, a rugby league Adelaide Ad, Adelaide Rams. Adelaide Rams. Adelaide Crows AFL, I would have been, they, they wouldn't have taken me on with AFL. But um, no, it was rugby league. It was the beginning Crows, of Super yeah, League, yeah. yeah it was the yeah, end of the 95 World Cup, just before rugby went professional and Sands still came in and, it, yeah, it was a really interesting time. And they approached me, Michael O'Connor, and a couple people from Super League to come and mm. join the Adelaide Rams and go check out the facility and what do you think? Because I'd gone from obviously making that tackle, we get knocked out of the quarterfinal and all of a sudden I can't play. And, and right, like, yeah, that was kind of it. And it was like, hey, do you want to play? We think you could do a good job. Um but no, I you I turned it down. Turned it down. How, how come? How come you turned it? Did you, did you just love rugby union? Yeah, I, I love rugby I, union. I got an AIS scholarship. That's what I got in Canberra. So I was at university. So end of ninety two, I got an AIS scholarship um, for rugby. So that was really handy. Mm. In Canberra got all the facilities, and that's when AIS was like amazing. You get people like. Linford Christie and, no and, and Colin Jackson, who's my doppelganger apparently over here. I get this one all the time. <laughs> Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson. I'm not Colin Jackson. And they came and trained at the AAS. I remember seeing them. Like They were both in pretty good nick. And they'd use that facility because it was world class. You had like, state-of-the-art S, sports science, sports medicine, biomechanics. And they'd do... They actually didn't come for the Grand Prix series. They just did it for this block of like six weeks of just incredible training. When they trained at the AIS, yeah, you got some of the best Australian rowers, basketballers, all sports in this facility. It's a, it's a centre of excellence. They'd come in, everyone would just drop and just watch them train. They were just next level. Um, so it was that kind of era. So I was fortunate enough to get that opportunity, and um, and the Wallabies were like amazing. So the Wallabies at that stage were using 
that program to to develop the under twenty ones or the under twenties, which is common now, to be the next generation. So we could not no, but that was what we did. So if you got into the Wallabies as a young like Tim Horan or a Jason Little or myself or a Matt Burke or those types of players or a Joe Roth, you already you already had that program. You're yeah. you're already in you're already in the program, which was really, really good. Boys, we need to finish off with um some predictions for the weekend uh, return of the Six Nations. Firstly, though, George, we've got you here. Can you just give us a couple of lines on what you've made of of, of each team? You know, just thoughts on, let's start with Scotland. They've, they've got a really good understanding of their identity. Really hardworking pack. Um, really solid set piece. I love their back row. They, they really, they're really complementary. Um, and that enables, like, that back line to function really well off the back of... Like he, there's there's some genius uh, around Finn Russell, isn't there? He, he's lovely to watch, and when they provide a good, gosh, platform for him, and it's speed of ball, and he can play flat, and he's and he's in motion. It, good luck, good luck defending it. And then you got Hoggy, who's he's not a bad fifteen. He playing on the other side of the ruck or floating, it's dangerous. They're, they're really they're a really hard team. They're a team you don't want to play against, um, and they and you know they can put thirty points on you. Um, so you you better be on, and and they don't they don't go away. They were nineteen nil down against was it France? Yeah, yeah. They came back. You know, so I, I really like that about them. Um, right, let's, let's 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 calm him down. Get hit us up with thoughts on Italy. Again, Italy, France. That first game, spectacular. Again, showed a lot of grit to come back because France were cruising, and they came back. Potentially could have won that at the death. Um, so they lost their captain against England, which I don't think helped them because he's such an inspirational player. Then last week was stunning. Uh, I'm really impressed. Kieran Crowley's done a really good job with them. Uh, they know how they want to play. Um, they're, they're doing a high tempo. They're trying to get, obviously, be really efficient at ruck time, mixing it up from driving more, being off the top. Um, obviously, the number 15 just bobs up everywhere, just like an energizer bunny and just looking for work. And, yeah, they're... They're really, really impressive. Yeah. And Everyone's you can see second that. team, isn't it? You can Cap see that. Cap are out now, though. Uh, injured for the rest of the tournament mm. in the 15. Right, we've got, we got to keep pumping. We're run, running out of time, running out of okay. time. So England, go. Shite. England, England, <laughs> England are in that transition. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's not Eddie's team anymore. It's going it's, it's Bortho's team. It's Stephen Borthwick's team, um, which he'll – good improvement against Wales. Was, they needed to do that, go to Wales and, and, and just win, and they found a way to do that. Um, it'll be interesting these next couple because that's going to give them a better gauge and a better understanding of where they truly are playing, obviously, France and Ireland, um, which is going to be really interesting. Um, but, you know, I, I see improvement. There's always – England's always got good cattle, always got good players. So it's up to Stephen and his coaches to to mould them into – and find their identity because it's now they've got to do it and they've got the World Cup ahead. So do it. France? It's probably good that they've lost a couple of games, but they're – they're going to be very dangerous. They're going to be very difficult, particularly if they get that speed of ball. Their defence and their discipline has been a little bit uncharacteristic in the last couple, um, just as much as I've seen, but I, I like them. I'm a massive fan of DuPont. I love Intermac. I love how they, they, they can control the game. They're a big, powerful pack too, so, you know, it's all about that speed of ball. But they, they showed against um, it's uh, Ireland, rather, they can fatigue and make a lot of errors as well. If you if you stay in the fight, if you stay in the arm wrestle with them, so no, good team. Uh, Wales depressing this a bit. Yeah, Wales is. Yeah, Wales. There's this is a fair bit going on. I think there's a bit of. Yeah, it's a yeah. There's no. a bit of a <laughs> yeah no yeah no. <laughs> it's a bit of disappointment. Yeah, so hot. Yeah, it's, no. it's, he, he's an amazing coach, Warren Gatlin, but he's got his work cut out with that group. Yeah. And Ireland. Yeah, world number one. They can super impressive on both sides of the ball. Uh, Undisputed. Like I just mentioned that that try they scored against France is that intelligence too. Caddy's doing a really good job. He's you can see his you can see a bit of his DNA. He was a very smart footballer. No, just really well rounded. I really like Ireland. And but the, the challenges like we were talking about them now. These two games are big for them coming coming up, and then we'll see what happens in there yeah, when we get to France. That's going to be the ultimate litmus test, isn't it? Who's going to be saying four more years to the Irish? That's the real question, if it comes round. Uh, <laughs> if they get past the quarter, they've never done it, they're going to be hard. That's that, that's Everyone's got, yeah, got to get over. It's a bit weird then. Mm. You've never been there before, I reckon. 
Mm. Uh, right, we're last final minute. This is our uh, George's our um, quick fire round. We ask everybody these <laughs> questions. First thing that comes into your head: best player you've ever played against? Zin Zambro. Best player you've ever played with? I'll go with Joe Roth. Could have gone Steve Larkham, but Joe Roth was pretty amazing. Is Lark's going to be a bit annoyed with that? Or? No, no, because Stevie knows that. Like Roffy, we called him Giggsy. Like he was, like, <laughs> he was just could do anything on the field. Like just, like a, just let him play. It's Joe Roth. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest fight you ever saw in training? Uh, probably Owen Finnegan and Bill Young. Forwards, like silly forwards contact and they carry on. Like, you know, they, what is this? You know, you just get yeah. a bit pushy. Do it's got to be the guy. Yeah. They, they make us do it. They, put us they in make balls. us do it, man. Yeah. Balls and scrum make you want to fight. <laughs> um, player that rubbed you up the wrong way the most in your career? Probably Fitzy. Sean Fitzpatrick. Probably there's a long list of that. Fitzy's probably like far out Fitzy. <laughs> it's compliment though, Fitzy. Current player who could be your best mate? Oh, there's a, there's quite a few. I like Mac Hansen. I, I really like Mac Hansen. Does, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he does seem like, like some boy. Like yeah. Uh, when you were captain of Australia, hardest player to manage? <laughs> there's a few. Um, the hardest player to manage. Andrew Walker. No, Walker was all right. Like he just had the Walker was fine. Like we could manage Walks pretty well. Um, <sighs> On the Fijians? No, they're all good. I'm just. I go with Matt Rogers. I go with Rogo, but he wasn't. He was just. He was just a free spirit, Rogo. But we, you love that about him. But <laughs> he was. So I didn't find him that hard. But like, if, you, if you've got to answer your question, you can't sit on the fence. I will go with Rogo. Love you, Rogo. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, three players with you in a cab on the way to the biggest party of your life. Who are you taking? Skulkberger, George Smith. And Tins, if he doesn't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, Skulk's a good boy. Eh? Yeah, we like, we like Skulk. He's a good, he's a good boy. Well, uh, sadly, that is all the time we've got left for this week. Huge thank you to uh, Ryan and to Max and to George. Thank you for coming in. And to all of you for listening and watching. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>